Welcome to At the Table with Tony. My name is Anthony Shilia, better known as Tony Manja. And tonight I'm excited. Tonight I'm really excited. We have two guests on. So we have two guests instead of one. So it's it's gonna be we have a fun a fun night tonight. And I want to introduce my guests. We have filmmaker Robert Tunnell and his wife. She's an author and historian, Shannon Tunnell. Shannon uh, Col Coliani. Am I saying that right? Your 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 maiden name? You guys, are you Coliani. there? Coliani. Coliani. So, so I, I want to thank you so very much for taking some time out of your yeah, out of your schedule. I hear you. you. Do you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yep. yep okay, good. good. So I want to thank yes. you again for taking some time out of your schedule to come on the show. And uh, so, so let, first of all, I, I guess in a way I'm I'm late to the party because we're talking about the feast of the seven fishes after Christmas. So, so this is kind of like a, we're we're getting ready for next year. <laughs> We're a little early, so Robert yeah. is the hey, is the. I, well, I I just bought a fish necklace. Yeah. Really? Go ahead, Tim. We're at a little lag. Say that again. No, I said so. Lag. Even we're 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 a year. We're like either a, a little late or a little early, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. It it, it seems <laughs> for us the last last few years it's just all year yeah. round. Because it's like it's like our job now, you know. And I literally well, just well, closed a bid on an online auction for a fish necklace for next year to wear. So I'm already really for next year too. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we'll 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 get into the whole because obviously you you have a big festival down in in West Virginia, you know, a couple of weeks before Christmas. We'll, we'll get into all of that, but there's a lot to cover tonight because there's you know we're kind of talking about. West Virginia, the food of West Virginia. We're talking about the movie, The Feast of the Seven Fishes. So, so there's a lot, there's a lot going on this evening. And and again, I'm I'm excited for it. So let's 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 dive right into it. Um, you you I guess a couple of years ago, you you guys wrote a, uh, a I guess it was a comic book, right? A, co a comic strip about the Feast of the Seven Fishes. It actually started. Um, I think I started it in 2004. To be honest with you, I I had uh, done a deal for a horror movie. And then they, you know, the people were like, what do you want to do next? And I was like, well, this romantic comedy about my family cooking fish on Christmas Eve, <laughs> uh, which did not go over well. But I had just done my first comic book graphic novel. And uh, one thing led to another. And, and I, uh, I actually did it first as an, as an online strip, an online comic strip. I was interested in the medium. And um, I mean, she thought I was crazy because she's like, because I was like, She's like, who's publishing this? And I go, I'm going to put it on the internet and give it away for free. And she's like, Wait, you're nuts. Um, but that's how we started building an audience. And uh, the book came, you know, a year later. And again, er every step of the way with this, people, people like didn't believe, or they would be like, why are you doing that? It doesn't make any sense. And like, no one wanted to publish the book, so we just created our own company, published the book, and then got nominated for the Eisner Award, which is wow. Like, Oscar of comics. I mean, on paper, none of this makes any sense. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I, I guess it had to be. So when did the book come out? When did the book actually come out? The book, I think, came out in 2005. Because yeah, I remember I, th th there used to be, I, I live in North Jersey, and there was a store up here called Chef Central. Absolutely. And, and if yeah. I'm not mistaken, you guys were there because Twice, I, I have yeah. I have a sign. My, my book is actually signed. Wow. <laughs> so you got it from back. And those were fantastic. I loved doing this. Because so many people, dozens of people would show up. Yeah. yeah. And we would cook and talk. And I, I just, it was my, probably the most fun signings ever. Well, Where I guess we should, we should probably introduce people in case they don't know, in case they've been living under a rock for, for a hundred or a hundred and something years. If they don't know what the Feast of the Seven Fishes is, is or are, I guess the feast is, um, it's, it's, it's a celebration mainly by Italian Americans, because I think that we talked, uh, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago. You, um, you made an appearance on a, um, a, a, um, the Abruzzese and the Molise Society, uh, out of Washington, D.C. They had a little talk. With, with you guys, Ray Abruzzo, um, uh, Paul, uh, I'm not getting Paul, 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 Paul Ben Victor. So you, you guys, you know, I, I think I had mentioned that not everybody knows or, or her, as Italian Americans, they don't all know what the Feast of the Seven Fish Fish is. So can you first, I guess, explain a little bit about what is the Feast of the Seven Fish to you guys? Well, I think the, the I think what's important to understand is, um, uh, and it's the point I want to make anyway, was, is, is that particularly like when I did the, the film in particular, I didn't want to come off like I'm some expert in this. I'm trying to take it 
you know, from the perspective of a family who just does this, to be honest with you, we called it Christmas Eve. We didn't, we just knew we had fish on Christmas Eve. I, I didn't, I, the first time I, I was like 30 when I finally said to my mom, why do we do this? And what is it? She goes, oh, that's the Feast of Seven Fishes. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a Southern Italian thing, I think, because I'll meet people from Northern Italy and they go, there's no such thing. And then you kind of have to educate them. <laughs> Italy's a little more complicated. There are people that live somewhere other than Tuscany. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, I think I made the point on that show when I, I find it just amusing when people suggest that this is not an Italian thing, that it's an American thing. And I'm like, so one, what, 1 1.2, 1 1.8 million Italian immigrants moved to America in a time of no mass communication. Most of them probably <laughs> couldn't read. They moved all over the country and simultaneously started serving fish on Christmas. <laughs> and uh, I just don't think that, I don't think it went down <laughs> Um, but, but but it is interesting because I know that that my that my I think I might have made this point too on that on that on that program was that a lot of times uh, the the vigils of of big solemnities of big of big uh, Catholic holidays would always be um, meatless, so it would make sense that a lot of times they would they again like you said it was just Christmas Eve and it would be these meatless meals so whether it was fish or whether it was some kind of a uh, baked pizza. So, so mm -hmm. it does, it, it, it does make sense that again, being a meatless, a meatless evening, most Italians, especially being, you know, if, if they were religious or they, they follow the, the traditions, they would be following this, 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 uh, meatless festival. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, I, which Shan wasn't on that one when we did the Italian American podcast and Patrick on there was like, really was blowing my mind <laughs> with stuff I didn't know. And I, and I want to be very clear. I didn't want to know uh -huh. when I, and because that that changed the authenticity of my story. If I come in pretending that this character in 1983 said, "Oh, we do this because of that," no, they didn't. They did it because it was tradition. They weren't they weren't overthinking this. Yeah, exactly. And, and that and that is, I, I think that that comes across great. I mean, very, really well in the movie because you know you're, you're obviously. So let's let's talk a little bit about the movie. Let's get into the movie a little bit. So so give us a little a brief um, synopsis or a brief rundown of you know who who is the main character. And kind of how how it all like how it all plays out. Well, it's um, it's uh, it's it's Christmas Christmas the it's December twenty third December twenty fourth nineteen eighty three, um, which was a special year for me. Although I didn't know it at the time, but it was the last year that my great grandmother Isabella Oliverio was alive, and uh, kind of the last time the whole family, everybody was alive and doing this thing in a kind of an innocent spirit, and it was an interesting time you know, in American culture with m musically and with MTV. And there was just a lot going on. And there's um, a young kid, uh, Tony Oliverio, who is torn between his responsibilities or the expectations of his family and the family business and his dreams to kind of maybe step outside of that world and maybe pursue something not in the old neighborhood. In fact, not even in the state. And uh, simultaneously, there's a, a young girl who is uh, not Italian at all. <laughs> who um, is, uh, they kind of meet on a, on a quasi blind date and she kind of gets dragged into the world of his crazy family's Christmas Eve. And so for her, she, it's kind of, she, we kind of follow her voyage of, of exploration or, you know, as she kind of is exposed to a completely different way of doing Christmas Eve. And I, I always love this thought and I wanted her character to say it, which is, you know, for a lot of people, Christmas Eve is like the most quiet night of the year. And for ours, it was like, you know, like a riot, like, like it's <laughs> a train wreck breakdown. Uh, and I loved Christmas Eve, frankly, more than Christmas Day, because it was just so much fun. And that we were doing things together. Yes. And, yes. and she is amazed at how there's just so much going on instead of sitting there, you know, quietly. And the, like the whole neighborhood would stop. Oh, my God. Your yeah. Grandfather's yeah. house and visits. And so it you know, the community came, it was, it was nice. Yeah. So you, so both of you grew up in, in the same town? No, no, the, uh, the same area, but not the same town. Okay. So, so let's, let's, let's talk. So uh, again, the, the movie takes place in, in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. 
And when most people, I mean, let's be, be I guess, I mean, being a, you know, a, a, a New York Italian or a New Jersey Italian, we only think that there's only, uh, there's only Little Italy, uh, Mulberry Street, Arthur Avenue, uh, you know, may, maybe we'll give Philly uh, some credit here and there, Boston's North End, but we kind of forget that there are so many rich Italian enclaves throughout the United States. Well, it's, in it's, my, yeah, my, and my family was from Bloomfield and Pittsburgh. So okay. that's where my Italian family were, were from. Again, I mean, like, I, but I, I do a lot of like traveling on the weekends. So like, we're, I, I always grab my wife. I say, let's, let's go into car. We're going to find another Italian enclave. And literally, <laughs> I mean, and, I, and I'm only going like in New Jersey every week. And I find these little, little nooks and crannies throughout New Jersey that have rich Italian history, rich Italian American history. So, so I, I, I think that sometimes, you know, Everybody says, "Oh, Brooklyn's the best. New York's the best." Yeah, it's great, but we have to we have to realize that if it wasn't, you know, first of all, it was the the, the hard work of the Italian immigrants coming over here trying to make a difference for their family, uh, you know, and they and they settled wherever there was work. Mm -hmm. So, in, in in West Virginia, it was the mines, right? Absolutely, well, and the mills and, and timber, timber, the mines, the mills, um, all of it. Yeah, and. and it and also, and I think that you raise a good point, too, because in every once in a while, you know, I'll, I'll hear from someone saying, well, this wouldn't have been like that. And it's like, no, this wouldn't have been like that in your town. The people from my town, when they watch this, they're like, oh, my God, you know, it's so precise uh, because there is a unique, you know, it's not monolithic. There is a uniqueness. And that's what makes it so wonderful. And we talk and she can talk way better about this than I can. But the adaptability and the. You know, I, I think I said this on that thing with you, the, the relatives of mine who taught me the most about foraging and hunting and fishing and kind of adapting off the land were not my dad's Jamestown, you know, 350 years they've been here, people. Uh, it was my Italian side. Yeah. And they they knew where to go find the, whether it was the pokeweed or the mushrooms or, you know, or my grandfather catching a giant turtle and, and then his mother <laughs> making this incredible soup out of it, you know, just... You, you know, I mean, half, a lot of the fish we had on Christmas Eve were fish that he would catch during the summer and freeze, you know. Uh, wow. there's well, just... and most of the Italians all in the mining camps, they, they all had gardens. So, you know, they, they had to grow and bread food. Ovens. They had to grow food to supplement, you know, because you just weren't paid anything. And you had to buy everything at the company store. And what you couldn't, if you had a large family, you had to grow extra food. And so, I mean, all the Italians in the coal camps had... Elaborate gardens grown on hillsides. Any anywhere you could put something, they would grow something. But but you, but you are right because the uh, Italian. I mean, not not to say. I mean, obviously this is more of an Italian American show, so we're always saying Italian, Italian, Italian. But a lot of these immigrant groups, they had they, they were they were they were very. Um, they had a lot of ingenuity. So they yeah, like you said, they can grow tomatoes in in places where you shouldn't be growing tomatoes. Oh my and, god. And, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but and again and, and again like like you said Robert they they're going I mean I know for us we have something I don't, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it it's called we call it gardoon No it's 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 from the artichoke family or the thistle family and uh it's kind of a I, I think it's more of a sicilian thing and uh you find it on the side of the road so I remember as a kid my my and, and the one thing about gardoon is that you never you never told anybody where you found it because that was your spot and if you if you told somebody your spot Oh, that he, then you know, all the Italians would be going there, and they'd be taking, they'd be you know in. Pit. They call it Cardoon too. Does, Car, yeah, Cardoon. We we call it with a G. Cardoon or. or that, I, was, I was like, I know Cardoon, but I don't. Yeah. Know. Gardoon, but yeah. <laughs> that's the way we say it up here. Like Gardoon, we have the Gardoons, but but no, but again, it's it's just you know if if they had like so I remember as a kid, my my dad he would take me to like up upstate New York, and uh, he would have his little patch. We would leave early in the morning. And uh, you, he would go out there with the, like the machete and cut these these gardoons off, and he would come home, boy, clean them first of all. It would take you hours, and you get all the spiny things in your fingers, mm -hmm. and then you have to peel it, boil it, and then you would fry it. But but really, the the end the end result was, mama me, it was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> so Sh Shannon, now you are a a food a food historian or a historian? Lo local historian, but I focus okay. a lot on foodways and. Um, with the festival, I've always run the cooking school. So every year okay. we do a cooking school for about 100 people, and you sample seven different dishes every year. Um, and that's been sort of my baby, uh, just trying to preserve these recipes for future generations. 
So explain a little bit about the festival. So there is there is a Feast of the Seven Fishes festival. Now it's in Fairmount? Fairmont. Yes, Fairmont, West Fairmont, Virginia. Fairmont. Okay. Second, second, second Saturday of December. Second weekend in December. Uh, weekend, yeah. yeah. School's the night before on the Friday night. Saturday's the the festival. It's a street fair uh, in downtown it's Fairmont. It's not even fancy. It's street. literally, and it's like a holiday homecoming yeah. for the area. Um, and, you know, people just... You stand on the street, you listen to music, you eat, you drink, you visit. Um, eat, smelt, listen to polkas. Yeah. <laughs> drink. And we always have polka at uh, our Christmas Eve. And po polka? Yeah. Polkas it's a West Virginia it's a thing. thing here. Um, really? Yeah. We play polka music during the festival and always on Christmas Eve. But what 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 is the is is it was it brought by another by another ethnic group or what is the is, just, what's the history behind it? Well, I do think did. that's part of it though because yeah, you, you know well, these. The, the, these mining camps were like the UN, you know, you had, I always say like, I could walk out the street from my grandparents to the, to the, to Josephine Priolette's store at the end of the street and get yelled at in like four languages. <laughs> you know? uh, and it was really, it was, and I think there was a lot of cross pollination, but polkas were just, I don't know, in our house, I made a joke in the film. The kid says, the, they, we play polkas because they're like Christmas carols, except they don't have anything to do with Christmas. Yeah. I thought <laughs> Christmas carols when I was a kid, because I'm like, <laughs> You know, it, it was Dean Martin and it was Frank Sinatra and it was Polkas. I, you know, it was not Julie Andrews. That was like, that was the next day. Not. <laughs> I, I got to be honest. I, 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 I do love a good polka. Oh, me oh too. yeah. It's awesome. Oh, I mean, it, we could say, but again, it's something about it. it makes you want to move. I, and I think that's, yeah, I, I, uh, I think that, that you kind of see that even in, in the film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and we we've had two uh, musicians with us since the beginning of the festival, and they they've sort of backed off a little bit because they're they've getting aged, older. they're getting older. Um, but they like during the cooking school, um, in between me setting up the next person that's going to cook or breaking the other station down, they play polkas. It's like two guys, and that's awesome. Like the the audience just goes crazy, and you know you're sitting there drinking wine and uh, eating and listening to music, all for twenty five bucks. <laughs> Mama mia! You get your, you get your yeah. belly filled. I mean, you get a generous sample of everything. So now the so when did the feast actually start? When when did when this when I, 15th, uh, this was our fifteenth year it, for the festival? So I guess technically it's because if you because you know the first year's year one. So I think it started two thousand six. Our friend, uh, a businessman in Fairmont, Lou Spadafore, he actually came to me and he said, you know, I think we should do this. And I instantly knew it was a good idea, but just like everything else, the movie, the book, the comic, people are like, why do you want to do it? It's not going to work. People are not going to go stand outside in the street all day <laughs> in the cold. In the cold. The cold. And it's like these people drive 90 miles to Pittsburgh to the strip district yeah. and hang out all day to buy bacala and drink. Believe me, <laughs> they'll sit out here if you give them something to do. And it, I remember when we did the first festival, the, uh, about 10 minutes before there was no one it's like a ghost town and my one friend jimmy was like he, he kind of yells at me across the way and he's like hey bobby i did this because i love you and i'm gonna lose my shirt on smell and this and that and at one o'clock i hear him yelling at me and he goes i sold out you know and and that was the beginning there it was like the if you build it they will come and and people just went crazy for it so people come from all over Oh, now? Yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, we get, like, there's one, I know there's people, yeah, they come from Chicago yeah. every year. Yeah. And we wow. have that come from Pennsylvania. Um, oh, my God, D.C., Baltimore. Um, we, the furthest that someone has come is California, I think. And it also now, I think, too, it's it gives people that are from the area but maybe live somewhere else because it's the second week of December, so you have a little time before Christmas, and it's actually now they schedule that as a time to come home and visit and then go back and celebrate Christmas at their house. So it's a good time um, for all of that. And you get a lot of homecoming type things with it. That's why I, I, I would love, I would, so I, I guess COVID this year kind of, kind of put the damper on it. Correct. Yeah. We, we had to, we actually kind of pulled together a TV show for it. Cause it, it's really important to us that it keep yeah. going. Like her obsession is collecting and preserving the recipes. My obsession, quite frankly, is, and it's, it, I don't think it's as bad as it was, but when we started it, it was like, you would hear people, when they talked to you about Christmas, it was like, I got to get to the mall. I got to go do this. I got to do that. I got a Martha Stewart, this, everything. And there's all this pressure. And I'm like, when I was a kid, you actually collected memories more than presents. You know, you, you had shared experiences. That's what I love about the feast. 
is the, is this thing of doing together, you know, that we do with our children and our nieces or nephews or cousin, whoever, you know, you're doing things together and we're not in the car driving around trying to get this stupid stocking stuffer or something. I mean, it, I, I think something's lost and it has turned into, like Shan says, it's a real homecoming. It's a real... Um, and, and the new traditions that people have developed through all of this, I mean, I can't tell you how many people message me or want the recipe. I mean, I, I know 10 different people probably that now their big thing is to make limoncello. You know, I taught, the, taught them how to make limoncello one year. And now, I mean, people have limoncello offs. You know, they're, my cousin does key limoncello, <laughs> orange cello, limoncello. You know, he's become a master. He's very competitive. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, people, like so many people will get a hold of me and they're like, we do limoncello now every year. That's our tradition now. Uh, my neighbors down the street, the whole family comes over and they, they peel their limoncello, like their lemons very... Precisely. Lady. Yeah, I mean, I use a vegetable pillar, but <laughs> theirs are like like shreds. Michael like, probably end up watching yeah, this. And I'm and like, like, hey, how thanks long for the shout out. Do that, but you know, every year they. But you know, it's a family uh, thing now. They they do that. But Tony, but I think that what's part of what's cool about this too, and, and we have to acknowledge this, is that we over the course of what is it, Shane, four or five generations, we go from Italian to Italian American to American Italian to American. You're mm -hmm. the sixth generation, I believe you're yeah. American. And, they, and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to put the toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah. Nobody wants to, but at the same time, and I, and I say, I mean, it sincerely, and I, I say this, I try to say this every time, you know, some really brave people did some really brave things to get here, sacrificed a lot. You know, my grandfather, 700 feet underground in a coal mine every day. Um, I think it's kind of evil to not, try to remember that or try to embrace them well and i think that yeah your an your ancestors are, are waiting for you to discover them i mean it's important to keep their, to their memories alive and i mean we're only sitting here now because we came from strong people who, amen who that is so true i mean and and you should honor that. and you know and, and by the way though from a selfish perspective you know i can't i can't be with them now like i did and, you know, particularly, I was crazy about my great grandma. Mm -hmm. My mom has a very different perspective, but my perspective, mm -hmm. because she's like, she was because she was old, tired, and you were a boy, but I could do no wrong. Yeah. And, and learn so many cool stories and things from her. I can't, you know, I can't sit with her, hold her hand, or do anything anymore. But when I smell that stuffed calamari in a red sauce, boom. You're there. Boom. You know, you know pe people think, and uh, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm the only one. But people think, I think that people, some, some people think I'm crazy because I actually like to visit the cemetery. Oh, we, I, I, that's I, our, I, hobby. our hobby. Yeah, I mean, because you know what? It, be, 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 besides, you know, visiting your family by by going and looking at other names, then I do a lot of like this ancestry stuff, mm -hmm. and then I start putting. I say, wait a second, that that name looks. I, I saw that name at the at the cemetery. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember that name. So you you kind of you 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 really start to put together the story of of who you are and where you came from, well, and that and that and that's so important. This is I swear you know you you're Italian you see a sign and everything right. <laughs> but this one time our son was having a lot of health problems was at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh and it's right next to this enormous cemetery, where your great or great great grandparents were my buried. great grandparents great grandparents were buried. And one day she was just so stressed and our son was having some tests and I wasn't there and she said I'm going to take a walk. And walking through the cemetery, you tripped and, and was, turned around, and it was her. She, that's how she discovered her great grandmother. No headstones, but Michelle, that's like a message, you yeah. know. That's like, yeah. And then, I mean, again, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's just the Italian. I mean, I again, I do more with the Italian stuff, but I, I know the the Italians are with the messages and and even like you know some of the some of the superstitions like the Malachi. I don't know. Do you guys that's, is it the Malachi down down in uh, oh, West yeah. Virginia? Well, that's why it's in the movie. You know the. <laughs> Well, and I, I, I'm usually I have my evil eye necklace on. I actually had my cousin make me one when my son with all the health stuff. And I, I when I'm stressed out, I, I put it on and it, it kind of, yeah. Now, now, okay. So I, I think that we talked about, I, Robert, I think we talked about where your family was from on the other show. So it they're from Calabria, your Italian family's from Calabria? Yes. Uh, San Giovanni and Fiore. Um, San Giovanni and Fiore. And Shannon, where, where my, is your? My father's family are Abruzzes. Abruzzes, okay. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know Rocca, what town? Rocca Cincamiglia. Rocca Cincamiglia, and uh, what was the other one? 
I know like one of it translated to like Castle of Blood because we laugh because he loves Dracula. And I was like, you know, you know that like he be like Ca the, Castel Sangue. Ca Castel del Sangue. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause Sangue is blood and Castel yeah. is so I I uh, this is great. So, for, again, my name is Anthony Shilia, Tony Manger. We are here at the table with Tony, uh, being joined by Robert and Shannon Tunnell. Uh, I, this is, I, I'm having a blast, you guys. And again, I want to thank you for being a part of the show. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this. This this is a great book. So, I'm going to tell people, people, I'm going to put it on. I have the, my little banners here. I could, uh, I could actually post it on here. So, go out and buy this book. This is Shannon's book. It's a, it's a culinary history of West Virginia. From Rams to pepperoni roll. So I, I I know what Rams are, but explain to me what's a pepperoni roll. Well, it was you know uh, it was created by a, a, an Italian miner, and it's really just pepperoni and a hot like Italian bread bun, uh, and I always have butter on top of it. They're best when they mm. come out of the oven, uh, and it was it was it was mobile food. You know, so when the miners or workers were going to work, you know, and, it, and if you got trapped in the mine or were late, it it, it had a long shelf life. So and it was preserved meat, preserved you know, the way meat. it was wrapped. But a guy named Chi Chargero is, is from Fairmont, West Virginia, did the first one. They fight about it, but he did. Yeah. Country Club uh, Bakery. Country Club Bakery. In fact, our friend Chris Bloss still has it. it the bakery's still in operation. Mm -hmm. The pepperonis were still amazing. I mean, there are other amazing pepperoni rolls in the area, too. I mean, people... But it's just, it, it's an obsession here. And they've went across the obsession. border. I mean, it's in Ohio now and southwestern Pennsylvania. But I mean, it, it really, truly is. And a lot, and it more so originally in north central West Virginia, it took a little longer, you know, to go to the southern part of the state and all of that. But um, it's everywhere now. I mean, it's synonymous with being a West Virginian. <laughs> so, I like so mine with sauce and cheese, by the way. You, so, what do you, you do? Know. You 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 dip it, or 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 inside you put the sauce you and the cheese. You slice it, and then you can put like well, like provolone or mozzarella in it, and then you eat sauce. Mm. And there's a whole mm. debate, of, you know, whether you're a sliced or a stick person. But I'm personally a ground person. I grind. I like to grind mine up in the food processor because you get an equal grease spot. Okay, because I, I I thought that I had I had looked at I, I looked up to see what a pepperoni roll yeah. was on, on the internet, and it looked like it was literally like a stick of pepperoni in 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 a piece of like dough. The original yeah. one was a stick, but some some bakeries do slice, and now some of them are doing uh, you know grinding it up. So um, now my son, who's autistic, that's the only thing he eats that I fix. So um, I bake pepperoni rolls every day. He eats wow. about a dozen a day. Wow. But it's, you know, it's just one I'm, of those I'm things. I'm taking some it's... shortcuts now. Like I, I keep some Rhodes bread dough in the freezer now and take it out every day because it's, you know, to whip up a batch of dough on the, on the whim is. But I love, and I just love the, that, that that's a uniquely idiosyncratic thing about us, about our people about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we're, but we're people who I was saying on one of the shows, I never saw a round pizza in person till I was seven years old at a pizza hut that we went to in Roanoke, Virginia. Really? I, I, I saw round pizzas on TV, but all the pizzas I saw yeah. were like rectangles that you could put like in a shirt box. I never saw a round pizza. Yeah, I, we grew up on- Nice, okay. big, thick. And you know. I'm still, I love a good Sicilian crust. He's more of a thin crust person now, but- you know, I still like my color I, sesame. I like a good- thick. So, so a West Virginia pizza would be a thicker, a thicker crust? It was. Yeah. I mean, it's now like tra 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 traditionally that that's what it would have been years in ago. Our, in our, in our, in our area, like Colossesnos, which is sort of the big um, that that's like one of our go to places. That's just it's really famous. And, and for the town it. I grew up in, uh, Tostillo's Pizza, they had big square pizzas. And, and like I've mentioned earlier, Josephine Priolet, that she made it. She's passed away, unfortunately, but she Rosie's. made it at her little mom and pop store, Rosie Salerno. Or, you know, my great grandmother. I mean, the way she made it, it fit in a shirt box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? But I mean, she, look, she did everything. I, I, my great grandmother cooked the Feast of Seven Fishes on a wood burning stove in the basement of this pretty primitive little house she had. She did the whole thing on a wood burning stove. And, and that, that's the thing. I just, I mean, how, how did they do that? I mean, you think about it. How it's did they tough. do that? It was just tough, you know. But 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 again, I and, and, and I, I did. I we're kind of jumping back. We're talking. We're jumping about. We're talking about the movie. We're talking about the book. We're we're going back and forth here. So it's kind of fun that way. But I did. I I did love you know the whole preparation scenes in in the movie. You know, kind of you know draining the uh, the water for the bacala, 
I mean, these, these, you know, it was too salty last year, you know, things like things. Like, but, but again, it's true because, you know, Italians like to give a good dig here and there. And uh, <laughs> so now these people were actually based on your family, correct? The people that, yes. you know, the, the characters in the movie are based on your, your, your family, right? Right, Robert? We, we shot in my grandparents' house. Yes. Do, was, so you still you still own the house or still no, in your family? We, my aunt, my aunt sold it. I think around two thousand five, yeah. two thousand six. Uh, we rented it. We had back. to rent it back. It was very no. strange. Yeah. But thankfully, he hadn't he hadn't done very much to the house. Yeah. So like so the, the wallpaper, and the door banging into the chair, still banged into the chair. You know, which was great. I was like, wow, we can, you know, we can. But, but now, so ha you could. Um, it was it was a very strange experience being in his grandparents' house shooting this film. Um, you felt them all around you and, um, it was surreal at times. Uh, so, I mean, so obviously it's a house or the house is big. Is it a small house? How, yeah. like, how did you, how it were was, you able to film in a, in a, in a, I'll tell you. And, you know, and I was like, kind of like, I'm not always the sharpest blade in the drawer. I mean, I don't know why it took me so long till my brother finally said, maybe we should just go look at it. But the reason it would work now, if we'd have tried to shoot it where we originally used to have it at my great grandma's, would have been a disaster. <laughs> seriously, in the basement, it's like a seven foot. It would have been terrible. But my grandfather, it was company housing, so it was a duplex. And when miners started making some decent money, finally in the fifties, late forties, my grandfather bought the whole house, knocked it open, so it mirrored right, and so oh. the, the kitchen on the other side became this big bathroom. But so we had this extra room that we called the playroom. That's where the kids played that looked right into the dining room. So I was like, well, if I do this, I know, you know, basically you're going to get a, a 25, 30 foot long space to get into work. But I mean, it was incredibly tight because you're looking at dinner scenes when there's like 13, 14, 15 people in there. What you need to understand, there's another 25 or 30 people on the crew yeah. over your shoulder. There's a couple of pictures I'm post. I have up here on the screen. I don't know if you guys yeah. can see it. Yeah. Well, oh, I should have sent you the mural, and Tony. Then I, I, don't think uh, I sent that. I fixed the food for. The, I did all the food for the film, uh, and I fixed that. What about a half mile away? Yeah. And we literally would have to transport it to and from, and uh, it, it was it was crazy. I mean, have you, have you, you seen the mural? I should find this. Actually, I I, I do oh, have. I think it's it. it's it's the background. Yeah, it's yeah I have got a better one. I'm gonna get my phone. And and send you i'll send it over while we're on oh. here and you can grab it <laughs> but they're doing a mural of this image in fairmont that it will be a part of the festival forever now and so 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 fairmont is what just south of like pennsylvania yeah yeah like where we live now because we i left los angeles a long time ago still work out there but live here um we i guess our house is about 11 miles from pennsylvania so fairmont's probably about 20 i mean you know, we, it's more like we're a suburb of Pittsburgh Yeah. in a sense, you know, it's like 80, 90 miles and really that's nothing. You know, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, Actually, so. I, I have a friend of mine. He has a restaurant down in Fairmount and I haven't been, I haven't been there yet. What? It's a, it's he, a rock, uh, rock, uh, Rocco oh, Muriel. Yeah. 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 Muriel. yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. He's, I love that place. That's wonderful. Um, it was interesting because I was talking to another food historian the other day and he's from Cincinnati and he goes and he's working on some stuff with the Midwest. And he's like, well, what what is West Virginia? Like, what do you think? How would you define it? And I was like, it, it depends. I was like, where we're at, we're very we have very northern, you know, food ties and things like that. I was like, and then you have some mid-Atlantic stuff. I was like, and, and then you have the South. I was like, we were uniquely a strange place like you know there's you can't really define it because you have I, the way that it sets and the way it's bordered by it, or, these places you know it's kind of like a crossroads it, yeah and the mason dixon line you know runs across and it, it's like two different worlds sometimes but that but that that, that really is that makes it for an amazing place to, to live an amazing place to grow up amazing place to kind of experience yes yeah, yeah absolutely well it's i mean even like within like the the West Virginia history aspect of it. I mean, you know, for example, the civil war, I mean, we were the only state born from the civil war, but also, you know, I mean, people li literally fighting for different sides, you know, and wow. you, you live in like each other's backyards, but you just, the difference of a, a thought process. And I, I just received the photo. So I'm going to see if I can, uh, 
upload it to the uh to the to the stream yard here um but in the as i do that i wanted to uh so let's let's talk a little bit about i guess film so the, the the film was filmed entirely on location in west virginia yes in yep. fairmont in fairmont in, Reed, so, so in, yeah uh, we and, did one day in Morgantown, West Virginia, we shot uh, some car stuff in, in Morgantown. But otherwise, yep. So all these the places area. that you filmed in, all the you know the restaurants, the the Oliveri's fish market, these are all real places. Yes, uh, my family didn't have a market, but our friend uh, Richard Demary, we're very close to the Demary family, and that's an Italian market. It's been in the neighborhood, you know, since the '30s. Um, and you know, people, it's just, it's really, we just grew up in a great place with a lot of great people. Like they just, they codepend with whatever weird idea I've got, you know, they're just like, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and Richard was great about that. And, but you know, it's really funny now is now you've got what they call cine tourism. So there's all yes. these people pulling up in front of his place. They want to get their pictures taken and then they go in and get a sandwich or whatever, or some of Richard's amazing sausage. And the one place, uh, that's called Chicky Joe's in the film. We liked it. Uh, it was owned by the Riggy family, but we um, we've actually bought that. We're actually operating a restaurant now. Because, really? What 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 what, what what kind of what kind of food is actually? I, okay, we're West we're, Virginia we're comfort we're, West Virginia comfort food. Well, there's the mural. There's, the, mur there's, yeah. the, there's mur the mural. So kind of kind of explain what 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 we're looking at here. Um, and is that uh, that's not even the final one. I sent you the wrong one. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. It's, it's even way better than that. It is a, <laughs> it's being installed soon. Uh, Professor Joel Dugan, who's, who's a, an, an artist a teacher at Fairmont State University, painted the, uh, it's a 22 by 58 foot installation. Wow. With the idea that the, when you, you go up to get your picture taken with it, you know, you'll be there with the family, with the food, you know, being a part of it. I mean, it's just, I, I can't, I, I really can't, like, well, the food is a character in itself. Yeah, like, very in much. The, in the film. I mean, you know, it's and it's really, you know, what, what for me, the festival and everything is about is, is are those traditions, keeping them going. And, um, you know, I mean, we, we're already preparing our daughter. She knows how to cook them most all of it. We're like, you know, one day, well, I have told her, I was like, Christmas Eve is always ours. <laughs> I was like, until we're too old to, to do it. I was like, you can have Thanksgiving, you can have Christmas Day. I was like, but you're going to be here on Christmas Eve. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, already teaching her what to do. And, and also, so what and not being too rigid about it, you know, because yeah. again, I think it's important that the togetherness, like about the last four or five years, we, somebody brought something to the festival and, and heard my father-in-law Larry and I got into this like now amongst every other thing we do now we grill oysters now we always had oysters on Christmas Eve but now we put them in the shell on the grill and we hang outside drink beer drink wine and and shuck these oysters while all the other food we didn't give anything up because we're like the yeah. feast of about 225 <laughs> fishes now and uh and but you know it's like we have so much fun. Well, we do. Even um, if it's snowing, we're outside. And, you know, and my it's... tradition is um, we we do something traditional every year, like the fried smelt or the you know uh, stuffed calamari. We do one or two of those super traditional things every year. And then my tradition for myself is because I like to play in the kitchen. Um, I I cook something new every year. I try something different, get out of my comfort zone, um, try to get creative. Um, you she made a new one. That, that one that you made, she made a dish that I've never had before for mm -hmm. um, the, this cooking show that we just did. Um, I don't want to keep looking at my phone or I'd send you a cool picture of it. <laughs> uh, but what was it, baby? Was, uh, was it well, whiting? It, it or was, was sort it of my, it was sort of my take on uh, bakala because, you know, we didn't have time, you know, with the show and everything. So I was like, well, I want to do some type of cod recipe and talk about the importance of salt cod to people and all of that, um, but it was cod with lemons and herbs and potatoes and, and olives baked. One sheet, easy, um, stick it in the oven, walk away, mm. come back. Uh, but I also, you know, I try to do accessible things for people, um, and I try to do things that people can stretch their money oh with families and feed a bunch of people. Because he always says, like, well, we didn't have a lot of pasta. Well, you know, when you have 50 people for Christmas Eve, you gotta have some pasta to make some food go. Yeah, that's true. I, that was actually, 
I when, when I was when I was some I, I didn't get a chance to read the whole book yet, but I did notice that that I guess the pasta that was popular in this area West or, or in West Virginia was the uh was the kitara style. Kitara style, yes. Yes. So is that something that was that was kind of like you know that that was brought I guess brought over from where from Calabria? That Katara in the beginning of the film, you know, in the beginning of the film when yeah. she's making yeah. the pasta, um, that, my great grandfather made that Katara. That's the pasta I ate as a child was made on that. Yeah, really? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Where is it, honey? Is it upstairs? I should bring it. I should uh, it was over by the. <laughs> Maybe I can get our dog to quit being yeah, obnoxious. You're gonna have to let him. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, um, and, and he bought me one because we didn't get that one. No, much. we didn't get that one until we did the movie. Then my aunt yeah. gave it to me, or my great uncle, I guess. Gave it to me. So what? So what was it like I mean, to it, again? For myself, growing up, like when I would go to my grandmother's, my father's bedroom, she turned into a drying room for pasta. So when you would really go to, like dinner, like there was just pasta hanging all over my dad's bedroom. Uh, you know, we always laugh about that. I'm going I'm uh, to send you. I'm going to send you a couple more things while we're sitting here because these dishes that she just made, this one I thought was so cool, uh, and this was this that I'd never had, which is kind of like a cod with potatoes kind of a dish. So I'll send it along. Maybe you enjoy seeing this. So what 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 would be your traditional? Feast of the seven fish. What would what would be your traditional seven seven fish that you would be eating on Christmas Eve? We always have fried smelt. We always have stuffed calamari. Right. Stuffed calamari in a red sauce, or and also without the sauce, just with oil and cheese. We always have anchovy pasta. Okay. Whiting, usually whiting fried, like in a. Uh, although someone from someone, I think it was at Chef Central because I kept meeting people and they we kept trading recipes, <laughs> and they turned us onto a whiting salad, which is like whiting yeah, it's with um, red, onion, red onion and, and celery. celery. And then you kind really? of, and then it's almost like, a, and then just kind of a lemon vinaigrette sort of a dressing. Very, it's very light. Very yeah. light. It's fantastic. And that's do you guys do scungeal down there? No, we, no. we have. Did they do it one year though at the festival? Um, Somebody did. Robert may have, I can't remember. I mean, we've done everything at the festival. We've taught people how to, clean an eel and cook it. Uh, that was an interesting year, doing eel for 100 people. Uh, we haven't done meal here. We haven't done eel here for a minute, but yeah. we, we got hooked on, on baby octopus. Oh, I think I have, real. That's, that's the picture. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, pay, I clicked that's the wrong cool. one. Look at the food on the table, though. He just totally nailed it. He took pictures oh, from man. our table at home and started putting that stuff in there. Um, and I don't know about everybody else's family, but I was like, dude, you got to put some tangerines or oranges yeah. or clementines nuts. or something. Yes. Yes. Nuts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you always had to have the nuts. Well, and I think like both of us, our whole childhood, there was always an orange in your stocking. And until our kids were, I mean, we don't do it so much now, but um, when they were little, there was always an orange in their yeah. stocking because that's what, I mean, that's what my dad did and that's what his family did. Um that's that's a uh, I think Saint Nicholas used to give out the oranges, yeah. mm -hmm. so that that kind of plays on the whole Saint the whole Saint Nick. So what was it like then to film in your hometown? Was it you know was you know like when you're filming like your your buddies from high school were saying, oh Rob, what's going on? Oh, I mean, oh like set security, you know, is, which like Shannon was with, was with friends at the at our our friend Bernie's wine bar here. And at one point, they're like, so is this like a YouTube YouTube video? <laughs> The cast of The Sopranos doesn't come down for a YouTube video. Um, but it was weird because, yeah, you know, familiarity, I guess, breeds contempt. And because we live here and everybody sees us all the time, there's no, like, oh, Hollywood. They don't care. But, like, I would literally be on set directing and people would just – no one would stop them. And they'd say, I'm here to see him. And they would let yeah. him in. And I'd look up and there'd be – like, my friend Vince's mom just wandered in. You know, I hadn't seen her in 30 years. And – you know what do you say? Yeah, like, yeah. People you would have just, to leave. People I mean, would just wander in, and then we we had a, an offsite at what the community the building. community building in Reesville. And people would just show up and hang out, and like the stars and everybody were there. I mean, it was actually nice, but the, you know, you just never knew who was going to walk through the door. I my favorite. I won't swear, but they had we had to stop traffic for something. <laughs> And, you know, and I'm always very 
you know, in addition, I was always worried about safety, but I was like, you know, I was super grateful. And they had brought in some auxiliary, like police people or someone. In it. And I see, I recognize this guy's face, but I don't remember his name. You know, I'm just trying to be pleasant walking along and I'm like, Hey, really appreciate you guys. Thanks for doing this. And he goes, it's a bunch of BS is what it is, Bobby. <laughs> Man, there's like, I get no love here. <laughs> just, you're just a kid from the neighborhood. They don't, nobody cares. But that's what I love about this. Oh, because the traffic delay. When, when no, he just didn't want to be out in the cold. Oh, I think he just okay. didn't want to do it. You know? <laughs> so. Actually, I, I was able to upload. Uh, let's see if it's just taking a little bit of time. Oh, here we go. This, this dish looks amazing. Oh, so good. Yeah, that looks like where outrageous. I, where did you find that? I just sort of thought it up. So the, that that that's just I mean, that was just something that you that you just that you just kind of you know just said okay this this will go with the cod this is gonna you, you, well, you just kind of put it you know I I read recipes for relaxation and uh, in our in our house living with an autistic adult you know uh, who's very noisy at times it's hard to like really stay focused and engrossed in a in a novel so mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of like recipe reading and. Um, and I just take bits and pieces of things I like and put things together. Like, and I don't know, I've been, I'm blessed with knowing how flavors work. So, um, I'm but, glad about that. Well, I know we have friends though, who do yeah. a bacala potato thing. My family didn't do it. My immediately, my immediate family didn't do it, but. But, again, but, I, yeah. but I think, I think Italians have a way, again, I keep, you know, I keep on saying Italians, Italians, but I think that we have a way of, of kind of making something out of nothing a, a, a lot of times. Well, and that's what the, the, the Patrick from the Tiny American podcast. Was, was, was Mod on, look at that! Look at that crab. <laughs> well, you know, it was funny. You know, why I picked the crab was, you know, because of COVID, I, I couldn't get anything. Like I wanted mm -hmm. to do like a something that photographed well, like a big red snapper. Like, or something. couldn't get it. Couldn't get anything. Uh, you know, and we didn't have time. You know, we didn't have time to get the order in to for all that. So I saw them at the local grocery store, and I was like, really. I'll, I'll play with these guys. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm always trying to do stuff because when you're here, um, and even when I do the cooking school, like we're a mobile cooking school, I never know where I'm going to be, uh, which is interesting planning food for a hundred people when, you know, you don't know if you're going to be in a tent, a church. Um, we've been, how many places? I, I mean, think we've been six or seven. Out but, of I mean, 15 I, we, years. we cook on induction burners. This uh, was from the TV so. show that we just did though with her. Oh, wow. So what now? What do you what do you what do you make in there, Shannon? Uh, there, I think I'm making the Calabrian chili oil for mm. a shrimp for with like, Calabrian uh, shrimp. Chili oil. Yeah. So it's now, is, is 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 there a way that people can get your your, your recipes? Do you have yeah. a website? Are, are your Instagram? Well, I mean, I always am putting food pictures up on Instagram. I'm I'm working on a collection of things for the uh, for a book right now, but. There are recipes. There are uh, recipes in the original graphic novel, but yeah. she's just gone so far beyond it. There are a handful of like local recipes that were either my family or friends' families that are very sort of local to here. But part of the thing about doing book tours and things is, man, you know, I got turned on to so many. Although sometimes it's really funny. I met this, I keep going back to Chef Central in Paramus, but I went, I met this really nice lady. I met really cool people there. And she's like, you know what you should try? And she tells me this dish. And it's very simple, but I've never had it, which was sauteing anchovies in oil and garlic. And then you take a slice of bread, put provolone on it, and then melt the cheese with the hot anchovies in oil. Ooh. And I tell my mom, my mom goes, oh, yeah, we used to do that. I'm like, well, why did we stop? <laughs> because this is like the most amazing thing ever. And that's I try to do it on the morning before we start really cooking. Whenever I can, I try to have that first. Yeah. For me, anyway. And a lot of the dishes I try to like put together, like when I'm doing the cooking school or just doing like Christmas Eve here, like I figure out what he's going to cook or like with the cooking school, what the other chefs want to cook. And then I sort of fill things in, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I let them pick first. And, and I, cause I always try to have a balanced menu to where there's, you know, an appetizer, a main dish, uh, dessert. Sometimes we even do a drink. Um, so looking to where, and also like with here, looking like, cause they're on the grill, they're deep frying, they're, all the burners are going. So you, you try to like pick recipes with, well, I can stick this in the oven, like the cod dish, you know, mm -hmm. and, 
and really utilize your workspace um, so that everything comes out at the same time. So the, 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 the chefs that you get, so are, like, how does it work? So can anybody sign up to be like, a, no, yeah, I, every year yeah. I'm like, I, I have seven, I cook every year. Um, and it, it's, we've had professional chefs. We have home chefs. We've had family demonstrations. We had the Italian society. At, uh, our I know we class. had, a, we had uh, the gentleman from, um, I forget where he was from, like Florence WVU. or someplace, but uh, he was here. He was, he was in grad school or yeah. something. But he did a pumpkin tortellini and, and it was incredible. You know, sauce. and it's like, why can't we share these things? You know, so, so fun. again, so how, yeah. but how, how does it work then? So somebody says, okay, I want to, I want to cook for the feast. Is that, so is that how it works? Or kind of like, what's the, and cook yeah. With us? Yeah. Yeah, you should come oh, I would, I would, I would, I would love that. I'll come down with Pat, 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 Pat O'Boyle. Yeah. <laughs> Pat would be, well, Pat's coming. Oh, good. All right. If Pat's going, then I'm going to come. <laughs> yeah, so what I do is usually like all the chefs will get their own ingredients and you, you prepare a generous sample, like, you know, three, two, three ounce sample. Um, and we prepare usually for a hundred people. We usually have about that many and a little extra cause we feed like the people working and stuff, the volunteer. Um, but I, I set you up, we have a kitchen right now that we've been at the one local church for the last three years. So we actually have like ovens and like a sink and things like that. Um, uh, and you cook, you demonstrate in front of the crowd at while we're serving your dish. Um, you demonstrate. Oh, okay. And so I have two stations usually set up. And when one person's done, the other person comes on. And it's, 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 it's very a train relaxed. wreck, it's but it's awesome. Wreck, yeah. It's a train wreck. It's, and then, and but then, that's what makes it fun, I'm sure. Oh, oh. It, it's, well, well. People wander into the kitchen. You're like, hey, man, yeah. we're trying to work. Well, we, <laughs> we wanted it to feel like you are at our home on Christmas Eve. So we, you know, we, we like it a little chaotic and messy because that's just sort of, that's the way that it is. Um, you know, and, but yeah, we usually have some music in between and, um, it's just a good time. So I, Robert, you sent me a couple of behind the scenes, uh, behind the scenes photos from you when you shoot when you were shooting the movie, The Feast of the mm -hmm. Seven Fishes. So I'm gonna put them on the screen, kind of if you can, just give if you can see it, kind of give us a little bit of uh, uh, what, what what we're seeing here. Well, I'm there with I can see the the director of photography, Jamie Thompson's right beside me, and my AD Phil Rush is behind him, and in the distance, my good friend Porter Styles, my fraternity brother, who does. Mm -hmm. He's like I can talk him into anything, <laughs> uh, and we were shooting. Um, we were setting up, we were about to do some night, actually night exteriors, I think. Uh, it wasn't quite dark yet, but we were setting up, or maybe it was daylight, I can't remember, uh, to establish um, where Josh Hellman is juke, is kind of telling the story of the community. Um, and so we were actually shooting outside the restaurant, A Street Confectionery, which is which is now our restaurant. Um, now this, now this, is, this is your grandparents' house. That's yeah. my grandparents' house, yeah. Although now, the, the, the shed, shed? It's fake. It's fake? It's fake. We had to build it. Actually, our contractors who work here doing stuff with us are good friends of Bob's from childhood. And they, they that was their contribution to... Like, yeah, they, they, we, they, they got a credit the in the shed. film. They came and built the for shed. Jason Baker's a production designer. He's like, I need help. I'm like, let me get these guys. Because the shed that I was sort of basing Willie it on was, was actually at the next door neighbors. And it just visually would have... Well, it burned down. <laughs> uh, that story, too. Uh, but... Uh, which may or may not have involved friends and my other brother, oh, but uh -oh. <laughs> there's, you know, we'll leave it. We'll leave, we'll leave it there. <laughs> but I, I will, I will say this when I talk about, food, I mean, our families helped her dad, my mom, my brother, sister, my cousin, nephews. Uh, I mean, every people just pitched in. Our it was friends, a family and community community thing. And, and my brother Jeff was a producer on the film. But then, oh, that's us at uh, the wine bar. <laughs> we yeah, we took our the cast. Bernie's, our friend uh, Bernie lost his wine bar. That's the cast. Our, that's our daughter. <laughs> our daughter's in the film. She's the girl that <laughs> doesn't <up>. feel well <laughs> at the bar. <laughs> but, oh, the, 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 the underage girl? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but our my producers, John uh, John Michaels and Scott Woody, both, because they're, they're not, they are from California. Well, John's from Cleveland, Scott's from Canada, but they both live in California now. But both of them multiple times particularly the night of the church sequence where they would say they were blown away well, they, at how our community would come because, you know, to have 150, 200 people show up as extras, you're not paying them. And they go, but don't, they'll never hang out. You know, I'm like, yeah, they will. <laughs> and they did, you know, they were tailgating. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> My friends were outside the church tailgating. <laughs> the, you know, you know. so can you, day. you had to 
Can, can you give us some 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 stories about about the actor? You know, obviously Ray Ray Abruzzo, great actor. Oh uh, uh, you know, he, he, he's a real cat. You know, he was you know, uh, he was like amazing in The Sopranos. It's just his his character is hilarious. Kind of a, a totally different uh, d different guy in a way. Uh, in, mm -hmm. in in this movie, you know, he always had a cigar in his mouth. Uh, so can you give us some some like a couple of behind the scenes stories about about some of these these great actors? You know, I mean. Part of it was just just getting them uh, was uh, the most um, incredible thing. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I never dreamt. I mean, I had hoped that we would have some recognizable, you know, well, I always I wasn't going to settle for bad actors, but I was hoping, you know, the two or three roles deep, we'd be in good shape. I never knew we'd be nine, ten, hmm. uh, you know, with with names. And I mean, people like, you know, Andrew Schultz, who was an up and coming comic. And now he's got a huge Netflix special. I mean, he's blown up who plays Angelo. But, you know, but I mean, outside of that, I mean, you look at this cast, you go through it. It's just, they're some of the finest character actors working in the world. You know, Joey, Paul and Victor, Ray, Lynn, the late Lynn Owen, who we miss and mourn terribly. I mean, and then, you know, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm being, on, I just, I, I'm not gonna, I cannot pretend like I was just the cool guy who had everything figured out. I never dreamt that I would get this young cast. In my mind, I was like, I'm going to get some older character actors. You know, no, I didn't know I was going to get the kid from Santa Clarita Diet and the girl from Jumanji, you know, or, or Addison, who is a, just absolutely incredible actress. I mean, Madison Addison, Skyler, Josh, um, our new Discovery, Jessica Darrow, uh, who plays Sarah, uh, who I think is going to be doing big things. Mm -hmm. um, that, wow. You know, and then for the the lower, uh, you know, down the cast list, people that didn't have to work as much. I actually, we did a mix of finding people like Tony Bingham and Gene Zarzor, who Gene actually ended up moving to the front credits because she was such a huge part of the film, who plays Mary, who plays the grandmother. Um, uh, but we, we actually cast non-actors in places, you know, who were just, uh, because I knew they could do it. Like my said, my friend Porter, he just plays himself in the film. I said, just be yourself, just be. I was supposed to be a bartender, but then I got a call. Well, someone, well, one friend wants to do it. I was like, all right. Ah, uh, so you got, you got, you got, you got, you got pushed out this time. I got pushed out, yeah. Okay. And but you know, the, I think the whole thing started though was getting Josh Hellman, who plays Juke, and who is mm -hmm. for me is a pivotal, pivotal character. Because you know, like you said, I think I think you had mentioned earlier that he kind of does tell the story in, in that one mm -hmm. scene of, of the history of, of the Feast of Seven Fishers in this particular town in West Virginia. And he's, he's like, cursed with self-awareness, which a lot of people don't have. And so he's aware. He can see the chess pieces. He can't necessarily see it for himself. But but, but it, it is. And I always and I relate to Juke. I'm not Tony. I'm not that nice guy. I wasn't that good of a dude. I sure was <laughs> not that evolved at 21. <laughs> and um, but Juke, I related to because he 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 remembers everything. He mythologizes everything. He knows how the pieces fit together. And and uh, and it's uh, and he's a bittersweet guy. And when I saw Josh's uh, audition, I was just floored. I mean, he's from Australia. You know, wow, I mean, you 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 wouldn't think you wouldn't wow. think he's in Mad Max Fury Road, right? I mean, he's Striker in the X Men movies, the younger Striker. <laughs> you know, and then. And then now he's Juke, and he's this like you know like Cary Grant looking movie star, but he puts on a toboggan. And like, <laughs> well, and I, I think um, for me, like I love that character too because I think like with with having a special needs autistic son, there's you know to me that Juke character is a he's little bit spectrum. like my son. He's on the spectrum, but he's he sees everything but can't get it out, you know. But mm -hmm. but he's sees and knows everything that's going on and he you know if you could just be in the mind or whatever so that was bittersweet for me watching that character when everything was finished like i mean that was very t touching that's it's hard for me to watch at times mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but but again i mean the, really the 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 cast you had they they were perfect for for this role for the roles that they that they had Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very. And just very wonderful, happy. wonderful people. I mean, just very kind, and um, it was a you know it was a pretty good work environment. I mean, we've me. we've heard from most everybody that it was the most fun show they ever worked on. You know? Really? Uh, yeah, and because on the wow. weekend we would go out and have these big meals. And we did and... teach uh, my dad and I did teach uh, Ray how to make pepperoni rolls. 
Really? <laughs> Ray's, Ray's so involved here now. He's like the godfather to some friend of ours. Child. child. No. <laughs> yeah. He, because he, he started meeting people, uh, you know, in town. And he, you know, he was here for how many weeks? And he just became good friends with this family. And now he's the god godfather of their son. So how long did it take you to film the film, to, to film the movie? It took us uh, 18 days to shoot the principal photography. But I did 19 days of second unit. I mean, whether it Whoa. Was, I can't remember how many days of food we shot, but every time it snowed, we did things. I mean, there are shots. I put something I was no, I didn't. I was going to put it up on Christmas. We had a white Christmas. It was beautiful. And I went out at one point and I took a shot with my phone. I should put it up that I needed a shot, a transitional shot for those montage sequences. And I shot the street light and then a tree at the end of our driveway. And we ended up putting them in the movie, you know, because it didn't work. <laughs> uh, so we were always doing we things like that. We were always pick up shots. He got in trouble a couple I mean, times. I got in trouble for um, trash in the kitchen. Well, we would have to do food pickup shots here. Yes. And I had just got a new, new, brand new stove. And, but they wanted to, sh they wanted to shoot the cookies rising in the oven as they baked. Yes, yeah, okay. So they had the oven temperature up to 500, as high as it would go, but had the door <laughs> open, it melted my knobs off. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was <laughs> oh. like, I just got that stove. Um, but we did a lot of, you know, like. Well, my brother and I, my brother and I got like 1970s Matchbox cars, and then we would go shoot them on blue screen and shrink them down because we needed cars and you say, well, if you could have come to us and said, here's a hundred cars from the seventies and eighties, who's going to move them? Yeah. Who, where do you going to get this time? Yeah. Like, man, you'll, you'll never know, but there are like, literally wait a second. So, you, so some of the, some of the, the, the cars are, are matchbox cars in the yeah. movie. Yeah. Not the ones they're driving. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, yeah. but you were, I wouldn't even, you told me that now I, I'll have to look for it, but I wouldn't even know that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Just uh, listen, I keep telling people to try to recreate the 1980s required 305 special effects shots for this film. Really? And that's more special effects than I had in the first four movies I directed. And those movies were about Merlin and Excalibur, uh, the Frankenstein monster and Dracula, uh, a, a plane crash or an air disaster and a ghost story. Really, all of the effects in those movies, we had more movies and more effects in this. <laughs> now here, now here's a see, here's a behind the scenes. Uh, it was so it, it was actually snowing, or yes, it was it was snowing and uh, made, on and off. And made snow too. We, we didn't have to make snow this night, thankfully. But this shot was really special to me because Alex Saviak, who um, who drew the graphic novel, uh, I learned a lot from him about visual storytelling, um, working in the in the in the comic book space. And he drew this shot for when Jupe does the phone call and you know engaged, you know, and then he, and then Alex just did this wonderful shot, high angle of Jupe going out the street with this street lamp, and it really made me think about different framing in sort of a, a daily comic strip that I hadn't thought about, and I, and I just it was always grateful for Alex for that, and I wanted to make sure that of all the images in the film, that's the one that's really a callback to the book. Hmm. Um, so this was a special moment for me uh doing that particular shot so now the cold me, I, moment, but. yeah it was cold now the 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 book is it still available how could people get a copy amazon. of the book yeah. amazon although okay. it is running it is running out and um i suspect we're probably going to have to make a decision at some point um because it's the movie's very helpful. <laughs> I actually, I actually have. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. I actually have two copies of the book. <laughs> so, so I, have, I, I have, I have two copies, and and even in the book. So now the 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 recipes in the book, Shannon, you the, these are your recipes, or how did they're a combination? There's some of like his family's recipes and 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 mine, and, and that was like the very beginning. Like you know, in a lot of things, it's we didn't really. It's hard to, for me to write a recipe because I don't measure anything. So when I really have to, like, people were like, well, how do you fix that? And I'm like, hold on, I got to think about it. It's a pinch of this. And that's, you know, so when we were trying to reconstruct, like, his grandparents' recipes, it really was, I would fix sauce until he'd be like, that tastes like my grandmother's. And so, you know, uh, 
so yeah, I've come a long way with writing recipes since those ones were <laughs> uh, first done, but it's still very hard for me to write a recipe. Uh, but I mean, but, but you think I always, about it. I have promises to myself every day that, you know, when I'm cooking today, I'm just going to take notes and write things down. And then I never do. But, well, but got, really, there's a lot of good recipes in the West Virginia book. Well, the West Virginia book. We, we were talking about the first yeah. feast book. But but yeah, really, but, the West but, Virginia but, book is a combination of everything. I mean, but when, but when people like Italians, when or Italians when they when they would cook the, the old school, you know, the, the, the nonnas, the grandmas, they like you said, they never measured. It was a handful of this. But what do you mean by a handful? Is it my handful? Or is it nonna's handful? So they 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 don't they don't they don't equal. No. Oh, no. Well, and and there's always funny stories too when you really research recipes and family traditions or whatever about how many people would leave one ingredient oh out. i was just i was just gonna say that i was just because yeah they, 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 they never they never wanted to to be one-upped no see and i don't do that like i truly always I, like i love to share recipes because i love to share food i mean to me food is love and it's the easiest way that i can express how i feel about someone is to feed them um and so when people ask me for a recipe i give them like the true recipe i don't admit anything <laughs> But that, but that, but you, like you said, I think food, in in a way, sharing a meal, breaking bread, is a very intimate act. Yes. Because you mm -hmm. you think you're you're kind of you're sharing a meal with usually the people that you that you love the most that you care about, and even when you cook, it's it's funny. Like uh, sometimes you know, I, people say you know you you go to these amazing restaurants, these expensive restaurants, and the food just isn't the same as it as yeah. as the food that's made by grandma. Mm -hmm. it, it just I I don't know if it's I always say is it the is it the the oils in the hands when when Nona's picking up the, the sugar I, I I it's it's amazing really right think about that think about how how food tastes different when different people make it even if somebody feels angry or they feel a little uh perplexed you can almost taste it in the food well and I like I never bake if I'm not in the mood I'm not a great baker anyway I only usually bake at Christmas and at Easter uh, mm -hmm. except for like pepperoni rolls but like when I do my pizza piattas, I'll wait until I'm in that mood because I know if I don't, there it's not going to be good. And so, what's pizza piatta? Well, that is um, a traditional Calabrian Christmas bread that we fix here in West Virginia. But it is um, a wine yeast dough. It's like the best dough in the world. Um, and then you fill it. You have to make the filling ahead of time. So it's chopped walnuts, uh, two large oranges raisins and then your allspice cinnamon and brown sugar and white sugar you let that set overnight or at least for like overnight to 24 hours and let all those flavors come together and then you make the dough the next day which is uh yeast wine melted butter um olive oil and a little pinch of salt and some allspice and then you fill that that dough you roll it out and it has a really beautiful sort of purple tint from the red wine. Mm -hmm. And um, you fill it with that nut mixture. And you can make them in little rosettes or you can do a roll and you, you bake them. And that is, uh, it's a very common Christmas thing here in north central West Virginia. And, so, and, and But Robert, you said that most people that settled in your town were from Calabria, right? In, in yes. Fairmount? And, and almost like primarily from one town. Yeah. From San Giovanni, Fiore. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, but we have friends like my friend Dennis is there, yeah. Sicilian. I mean, we have there. Well, there, there's, there, and there was one, there are... one town um, in Tucker County, like in Thomas, like that was like they specifically brought like a large group of Abruzzes Italians there. They had an Italian newspaper, but it, they all came for the timber industry. Um, I mean, we had it, and it's in the film briefly. But when yeah. I was a child, on the radio, and, this, and the show just went off the air. Um, not long ago, my friend Nick Fantasia, but his dad, Nick Sr., uh, had a three-hour show called The Italian Hour. And when I was a kid, it was in Italian. Yeah. Really? So when we went, when we had family dinners on Sundays, I, I heard everything. Because I remember they did the, they did, the, I want to hold your hand in Italian. Yeah. And I just <laughs> thought that was the coolest thing, you know. But yeah, I mean, it, and the show was completely in Italian. And then it was two hours in Italian and an hour in English. And then I think, and then eventually, you know, towards the end, it was just English. Um but uh, yeah, that show was on. My God, almost sixty years. But a lot of you know the the older Italians would not speak Italian, you know, because they wanted the children to Americanize and you know blend in. And so, we could uh, cuss. 
a lot of you know you, you lost a lot of that because it just wasn't taught and what was there a second wave in the 50s and the 60s or it was only the the initial wave of, um, of, of immigration i you know i'm not i'm not very conscious of that what uh, i do know I mean, is that when i was in the 60s when i was very young my great great grandmother passed away in italy and i know that my great grandmother's sister and a bunch of my cousins like they all picked up the whole family just picked up and moved to bc to victoria you know outside of vancouver really they would come and see us and like when i lived in la they come to see me we were very we were actually but, close you know, and a lot of italians that immigrated here during the industrial revolution they you know a lot of them their goal was not to stay here permanently their goal was to come here, make money, and be able to go back and feed and support their family. Mm -hmm. um, some stayed, some went back, but it, you know, it was, we're obviously you know from the ones that stayed. But um, you, you know, it, it was a different sense of you know. I mean, said that, you know, I just realized that. But Rena Potesta, who is in, um, uh, she's the lady in the with Nani in the church scene when they're saying mm -hmm. nasty things about the girl in a time. <laughs> But, you know, she she moved here in the late 50s because her son and I, her son's one of my oldest friends. In fact, that's really funny to direct a scene with the woman who, when you were a kid, actually beat your ass. And that did happen once. Really? Danny and I were little and we did something. Back. We were like five and we threw dirt clods at a house or something. She lit us up and then my mom came and I got lit up again. And um, But... Uh, but yeah, she, they came because then I know Danny, I think went back and spent a year and went to school. But I think they had family that had been here. Already. Something. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I, I don't, don't think remember. that there was any like large amount no, of, I don't think of, so. of, of Italians that came here during that time. Uh, but I know when I lived in LA, I had a lot of cousins out around Pasadena and when I would visit with them, I know they were still, people were still coming over. And yeah. You know, I, I know. Like, you know, like obviously New New York, even New Jersey, they, they, when they, there was that, we call it the second wave of immigration, you know, it was in the fifties, kind of like, uh, like right after the, right after the second world war up until about the seventies. But now it seems like there's even this, this third wave of, of, of young professionals that can't find jobs in Italy. Unfortunately, they, they're coming to America to, you know, kind of, again, find a better way. Well, I think what happened here too is mining became very mechanized. Yeah. Right. So where you used to have tens of thousands of mining jobs, you don't, you know, it, that just, that stopped. And is so is there still mining or no? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, nowhere. I mean, it's, it's definitely it's, phasing it's, out it's and it's out. Um, a lot of surface mining and a lot of these big, you know, like they're more down the Southern part of the state, but there are still some underground mining. Huh? Um, I mean, well, my, but yeah, my not young, like when my grand, my yeah, youngest yeah. brother just was a miner up until two years ago. So, wow. But, you know, it, it, it paid really well by the end, you know, not in the beginning. I mean, well, when my grandfather went into the mines, he went in, there were horses and they were, yeah. the horses were like blind because, they, because never, they never saw daylight. They never came out. Wow. They even lived down there. And the horses? Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Now, you, 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 I, I know we're kind of going over here. I, 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 we'll, we'll wrap it up after this question, but you mentioned something called a company. Now, what did that? What is that? What does that mean for those the that don't? Company owned the mine. They, they, they owned, owned the everything. store. They owned the housing. They provided the medical. So when you got, if you want to see a great film and get a sense of it, watch John Sayles' Mate One. If you haven't seen that film, what what uh, is it? John Sayles' Mate One. M A T E W A N. It's based on a true story uh, about mine wars here in West Virginia, which is a fascinating uh, time and place. Uh, you know, when literally, you know, kind of the U.S. government bombed its own people because of labor issues. Yeah, you don't hear yeah. it. They don't even want to make this place a, a designated site. Yeah. Wow. Still, there's that much pushback. But yeah, I mean, the Battle you, of Blair you, Mountain. That's you, it's a, like, OK, you need a pick too. and a shovel to dig coal. That's great. You can get it at the store. Once you've paid it off, you can take money to, you know, eat. And you so you would have to buy your own pick and shovel? Yeah. And you, you could only shop at the company's store because they paid you with script they, they paid, paid with, with money script. that was only redeemable at yeah. the company store so it was just a perpetual cycle of that's why i would get frustrated happen. sometimes when i would try to describe that I, the feast was in many ways i was trying to talk a lot about the immigrant experience and i had one person in hollywood say to me stop saying that you're embarrassing yourself this isn't really about immigrants and i'm like you're embarrassing yourself uh my family went through a lot you know there's so a lot of families went through a lot yeah. and uh Put up with well, a lot. I mean, the largest mining disaster in the history of the United States happened in our backyard in you know 1906. Yeah. Um, you know, Nanga, where I went to high school. They, Nanga, okay. I think, like almost what 
400. They know 400 and some 400. people, but they think there were children working in the mines that they never. Because you, you at that point, you were paid by the ton how much you dug. So, so you guys would bring their kids bring in to kind of other people in to help you get your more tonnage tonnage for the day. And you so know, so I'm, I'm I'm blown away right now because I, you know what, being from from North Jersey, New Jersey, you know, you you don't know about the 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 trials and tribulations that that our, our other you know immigrant brothers and sisters went through when they came here, and and this this is like this is actually it could get give you a little um you know a little, a little upset about the hearing these things. Oh, it's yeah. amazing how how, oh, how yeah. much. And my great grandfather, my, and that's the funny thing. I know there was some tension because my great grandfather's brother did not come here went to Brooklyn and I believe had a shoe repair place or did something with shoes. And I think, you know, did well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have no connect. I don't know if he had kids. I know nothing other than he came once to visit in a really big car. This must've been in the thirties. And I think my great grandfather wanted to just, you know, kill him, you know, <laughs> cause he came down showing that he was doing better, you know, I mean, well, you know, that's not the only story I've heard about that. We want to make sure that they had a bigger car or whatever. <laughs> well, that's why we too, we, we, we try to always, you know, West Virginia gets a bad rap in the media. And you know what? I, I joke with him. I'm like, you know, we're really the only people you're still allowed to make fun of, you know, because anyone can make fun of West Virginia people. Uh, and it, it, it hurts you because you know, the people that you come from and the people that have sacrificed and what we have been through as a state, mm. Uh, and what we've provided, you know, for, for the country. Well, it's funny. I was giving a, we've a, had more military service than I think any state per capita, per capita crazy. than any state in the union. And it's, and it's wow. a complicated place, you know, and it's always the, you know, the, the Hatfields and McCoys, which is fascinating and incredible and hundreds of miles from here. We're not from there. We don't have any relatives there. Uh, it's all, it's a, it's not us. I mean, I can yeah. literally walk out the back of this room, throw a rock and hit a sushi bar in a gourmet wine place. I mean, I, I don't know what to say. We got indoor plumbing here. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the thing that I do think is frustrating and why we tend to get passionate too about the mining thing is and I said this, I, I, I gave a, a talk at Lincoln Center after they showed the film and people wanted to talk about mining. Mm. And I was like, I just find it amusing that all these sins of mining are from West Virginia. When I'm driving through a city that does anybody in New York know how to turn out a light? I, I mean, come on. I mean, you didn't burn any coal? Are you kidding me? And we see this throughout the Rust Belt, okay? We see it in places like, um, you know, uh, Manesson, Pennsylvania, which, no you know, built this, and Clar Clarendon, Pennsylvania, towns that, that made the steel, Youngstown, Ohio, that made the steel that won two world wars and set up Detroit. And now that you're done with them, it's like, it's a nuisance. Yeah, you kind of just, you know? just, 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 you know. Discard it. Yeah. Oh, why terrible. isn't this? Oh, look how terrible this looks. Well, hey, nice person with a nice place in Connecticut. You got to have a nice place without pollution because some a whole bunch of people worked really hard under terrible conditions. I mean, and it's okay. It's not your fault, but if, maybe you own a little bit of that. Maybe a little, little gratitude for the people who laid it on the line. And the people that are still laying it I'm on the line. I'm still laying it on the line. You're, you're right. I mean, I, I think that's the thing. I mean, even even, you know, uh, the new immigrants that are coming and doing the, the these menial jobs, even you think about, you know, how, how our food gets to our table. You know, people, you know, the, 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 I guess it's uh, one of those poorest communities, I guess, in America is, is, is a community in like California where they, they a lot of them are immigrants that come and they pick the, the tomatoes, the what, whatever, you know, it's just, you know, we, we, we have to sometimes, I think, step back from our, you know, from our well to do lives or from our from our. 21st century lives and say people are still sacrificing for the American dream. Absolutely. Still no, sacrificing. It's, 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 like if you want to get my mother started, you know, you, you start anti-immigrant stuff and she, she just can't, she can't take it because she's like, I can't be that hypocrite. Yeah. Because of well, being be a hypocrite. Because, because I mean, really you think about most, most people that live in America today have ancestors that were immigrants. Well, every, I mean, pretty much everyone in America <laughs> well, sure, is, yeah, I guess. is an immigrant. I mean, you know. No, but here, you know, we talked about this on another show. Like I have a friend, a, a prominent Italian American judge. And he was showing me or telling me about the deed to his, the one house he had that said the house could never be sold to a black, a Jew or an Italian. That was written in wow. the D in the 1920s. So, you know. Even in 
the town we live in now. I mean, the neighborhood we live in, that was a part of... That was a part of it. That was a part of it. You couldn't buy a house if you were an immigrant here. Really? And even, you know, in West Virginia, we, we have, like, the, the New Deal housing, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, all of that, we, you know, and you couldn't get into one of those houses if we're an immigrant. So, you know, they took coal, poor white coal miners and gave them another chance, but not if you were an immigrant. Um, you, you didn't get that chance to get out of poverty because really a lot of that poverty stuff during that time was based on what was going on at Scott's Run. When Eleanor Roosevelt came here, she couldn't believe the conditions of how people were living uh, and started these homesteads, you know, to, to give people... A better chance, and so there's Arthur Dell and Eleanor, and what's the third one? Oh, the one? ones down in Tiger Valley. I can't think. Um, there, there. Oh, I can't but remember. again, stipulations on that free. you couldn't be, you know, you couldn't be African American or or ethnic born. There, there, there's that other old. There's an old song. I guess it's what Tennessee Ernie Ford, sixteen tons. Absolutely. Is that based on? Is that based yeah. on mining? Yes, absolutely. Wow. And this isn't just West Virginia, by the way. I mean, this is Kentucky and Virginia yeah. and Southern Ohio and, you know, Pennsylvania. I mean, it's, you know. Well, there's that town. In, I, I know we're, we're kind of going off topic here, but, but this is, actually fascinates me. There is a town in Pennsylvania that they say it was, is, 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 they had to actually evacuate the people because it, I it's guess on fire. The, still on yeah, fire. It's still on fire. fire. It's it's you're talking, what, 30, 40 years ago, yeah. and, and the town still, and the, the underground is still on fire. Yes. It'll never go out, I don't think. Well, my That's, dad. We're talking the other day. I mean, he remembers because he is in southwestern Pennsylvania. And was more my family were more mill workers mm -hmm. uh, than coal miners, and um, his whole childhood, the whole hillside, the whole slag hillside was on fire. Like they just watched it burn. I mean, there's wow. days that they can't go out of the house and really walk because the air quality is so bad. They give you advisories. Um, but but again, like you said, do people in you know even you know in North Jersey know about this? Do people in New York City know about this? No, nobody knows about this because for some reason we don't like to talk about things that that make us feel uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah. Well, especially once we escape, you know, and you ascend to that next level, you know, uh, I don't know. Well, we should we we should end the show on a positive on a high yeah. note, <laughs> and and again I I really do appreciate your time this evening, Robert and Shannon. This this has been eye opening for me because uh, I've been learning about stuff that I never I I would never even know. I mean I have a couple of books about about the Italians in I guess it is that that area you you mentioned it not not Musca um, Musca what was the name of the that area the valley. Oh, the Monongahela Valley, or I, mean, I think there's. I actually have a book. I might have it here somewhere in my library about the Italians of that of that area. There, there were Italians in that area, right? Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Largest, I think it's the just about the largest Italian celebration in the country is in Clarksburg um, on Labor Day weekend. I mean, it's incredible. Italian Heritage Festival. Italian Heritage, really huge, huge. Huh. A like hundred thousand people. I mean, we wow. get ten to twelve, thirteen thousand people at the Seven Fishes Festival. This thing is it's humongous. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> We don't want to be that well, big. It's a week. <laughs> yeah, it's basically it's a week. Long. And it's important. You know, it's it's important that this happens. So now how could people get in touch with you guys? Your your websites, Facebook, Instagram, stuff like that. What's the best way to get in touch with with, with Robert and Shannon? You know Instagram. Instagram or... probably. And you know, honestly, because the whole film business has changed. I mean, you know, 20 years ago doing a movie, I wouldn't have wanted to engage with the public. You weren't supposed to. They're supposed to be a mystique. I'm making a, a concerted effort to respond to every single person that's kind enough to to reach out to me. I have like you did for me. Like you did for me. I appreciate yeah. that. I had some fella. I don't even know how he went. I think he went to our website um, for the production company, uh, which is AlleghenyImageFactory.com or WeBuildStories.com. I think he can. Somehow they they did the, they got through to me. A guy did. And he sent the nicest email. And how am I not going to respond to that? I mean, who am I? You know what? Um, we love hearing from people and, and I find it fascinating that a lot of times what people really want is not to tell me what they like about the movie or anything like that. They want me to listen to them talk about their experience. And I love that because that mm -hmm. is, it has enriched my life. I mean, we were talking about Pat. I yeah. learned so much. He's brilliant. I learned so much from him, but things that I didn't know. And to be honest, didn't want to know going into the movie because it would have, it would have really mess with the authenticity if I went in like some sort of an expert. That's not the point. Now, 
we do a sequel, I'll be coming at it very differently <laughs> you know, from the perspective now of, of someone who's become quite you know hyper aware. But no, yes. they, I'm at uh, Robert to know one on Instagram. She's at, uh, at Shannon, Coliani Shannon Coliani to know at, um, at Instagram. And how could people watch the movie? Right now, it seems like the, where I'm hearing from everybody is they're finding it on Amazon. Okay. Yeah, that's you know, where I've watched it two or three times on Amazon. Yeah. And you can, and I, I encourage people, and I'm not, I, I only, the only reason I encourage people to consider buying the DVD or the Blu ray is there are some really cool extras. Oh, really? There, yeah. There's a, there's a pretty cool little making of behind the scenes documentary that we did. Um, there's some footage of my grandfather and my uncles in it. There's, um, a short film I did that's just kind of neat that's with it. There's a lot of photos and things. So there's like extras. How could how could how could somebody get the DVD? Amazon. Amazon. Okay. Amazon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And and again, we can we, you 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 can get Shannon's book Amazon. at Amazon as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's yeah. where that's where I got it. I got actually I, I, I got it last week. And the uh, Arcadia, the publisher, the Arcadia website, you can get it off that and and in West Virginia, it's like in like Barn Barnes and Noble, Giant Eagle, and Giant or Giant local Eagle, grocery store. Like Actually, there's, there's a picture for I guess from the festival, right? There you go. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. It's me coming with my father. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And and again, we mentioned that the that the that the comic, the the book can is 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 kind of getting getting low on, on stock, I guess, right? Very much so. <laughs> Especially so, if you can find the first edition, I'll tell you this little story that it drives me crazy, but now it turns out it makes it collectible. There was a mix up with the first edition. Um, when it was uploaded, for some reason, our art director person, he, that something happened and it defaulted to the uncorrected version. So the, the comic strips are all okay. But like at the time, I mean, I didn't know how to spell things in Italian that oh. we can do. They're messed up. Like I was trying to spell like testadora, you know, because yeah, that's the <laughs> and uh, I couldn't didn't know how to do it yet. Or or like they've got a character at the last minute I changed Tony's name, but in the text of that, so it kind of makes the if you get the first editions, they're kind of collectible because they're messed up. Yeah, I think I, mean, I, I most think people I, don't even know, but it I, I think it's funny. I think I have a, it says second printing. So I must have yeah, the, uh, you've got the, hold on, hold on, let, me, let me see, let me see. Uh, no, nah, that's a second edition too. It's got it, a different it, flip cover. Oh really? Okay. So that's, that's how you know, but some, oh, of no, no, editions, hold on. It says first printing September 20, 2005. Well then that might be it because something they have new, uh, uh, dust covers on them. To talk huh. about the movie and the yeah, because it, 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 this one does say soon to be a major motion picture, but on the inside it says uh, oh, you lucked out first printing. You there it out. is, right, right there in black and white. <laughs> so I have, I have, I have one of each. That's awesome. <laughs> I have one of each. Come and see it. I hope you'll come and I hope you'll sincerely consider coming and and, and you can cook cooking. Yeah, no, I, I, I would like, like, like I was telling you before, I, I really enjoy you know visiting these, these, these little known. Italian enclaves, little Italy's, and and really, uh, it, it I make it a goal of mine to kind of wh wh whenever I can, you know, just try to you know visit. But I know it's a little bit. I guess you guys are about eight hours from New York. Mm, is it quite that much? It's I guess maybe six and a half, seven. Yeah, probably. So so I know it's it's hard for me and my wife to go there, you know, for like a, like 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 a day trip. So it would have to be you know like a, like an overnight. I mean, type you thing. cook Friday night, and then Saturday you relax at the show and. You have a good time. You go back Sunday. It's Sunday, you have lunch at Muriel's, and then you go home. Exactly. I do. I do want to. I. I, I see Rocco too. I. I have to give Rocco a shout out because he actually for Christmas he sent me. He has three shirts that he has with with his with the logo on the back with the with you know with the uh, the hands, and he sent me three of the three uh, one of each of the of his shirts. So I, I appreciate that from him. Yeah. Well, see, it's it's a done deal. You gotta. You gotta. I have to. Do. I have to come. You have to come. But again, Robert, Shannon, I want to thank you so very much. I mean, really, I, we, 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 we talked for an hour and a half, and it felt like you know I, we could talk for another three hours. But I, I really do appreciate your time tonight. And, uh, you know, God, God bless you what you're doing. This is amazing stuff. Check check out Robert and uh, Shannon. Check them out. Again, I'll throw it on the screen. You can, So we have Instagram.com uh, slash Shannon Coliani Tanel. And then you can visit Robert on Instagram.com slash Robert Tanel. That's T-I-N-N-E-L-L. -L. 
is how you spell the last name and then the number one. So uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for 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 uh, tuning in. And Robert and Shannon, really, I I, I, pre I appreciate I appreciate you guys for for, for taking your time out tonight. Thank it was you so fantastic. much. Fantastic. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. And then uh, yeah. To take care. We'll see you soon. Again, I'm Anthony Shilia, better known as Tony Manja. This is At the Table with Tony. I hope that you enjoyed watching this episode, uh, talking with Robert and Shannon, uh, Feast of the Seven Fishes, talking a little bit about West Virginia, uh, the culinary history of West Virginia. What a great night. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Ciao for now.